Honestly, guys, it is a uh, an honor, and I don't just say that. I really mean like it's an honor to be here uh, with you. Um, <clears throat> when I think about No Hope Church, um, what you guys have here, and sometimes this is like, sometimes the things that you have become too familiar. You don't realize kind of what you're in. Um, and what you have here in NoHo is a very special and unique gathering. I mean, the fact that we're here in this small room in somebody's house, you don't even realize it, but being here teaches you more about the gospel. Just being part of a small knit community, a small house church, there's things that you know about the gospel just intuitively by being here that somebody in a larger church setting is going to have to work to figure out. I mean, the, the fact that, like, you probably know each other's names, and not just that, you probably know each other, like, where each other works, and, like, kind of maybe a little bit about each other's history and story, like, that is unique. Um, there are so many people, so many brothers and sisters across the country that can't say that about the gathering that they're a part of. And so, to be able to be here with you guys tonight, in my mind, is like, you know, I think if you were to think of, like, what's like a fun teaching opportunity. I think a lot of people would think about big groups of a thousand people or 2,000 person audience. And there is like an energy about that. But to be here is almost like a better or more accurate experience of what it would have been like to gather with the early church, you know, just in the middle of a city in somebody's house in a living room at nighttime because we're afraid Romans are going to kill us, which is probably not what's going to happen here. Um, <laughs> I don't know, the husband's pretty cray. Yeah, and I've heard that it's owned by Rome, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyways, yeah, it is really um, exciting for me to be here. Um, and today we're going to talk about the death of Jesus. And when I was kind of thinking about this passage, I realized that there were two kind of directions that I could go with it. Uh, we could really focus on the first section, which is where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or we could focus more on the second section, which has to do with like that Roman soldier that says, truly, this is the son of God. It has to do with this guy named Joseph and women preparing the body of Jesus. And if we had focused on the first section, we would have spent a lot of time talking about um, kind of like the theological truths or implications in this passage. Like we would have spent a lot of time talking about what it means that Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so if we had focused on that section, we would, we would talk a lot about kind of orthodoxy or right thinking or right theology. And I realized that if we focus on the second section, that we'd really be talking a lot more about orthopraxy or like right living what does Christian living look like and so I found myself um, initially trying to think well let's just do all of it because all of it's there but realizing that that wouldn't be super beneficial because we'd only get like three inches in on both sides so tonight is going to be focused a lot more towards the second section of what practical Christian living looks like according to how Mark chooses to tell the story of the last hours of Jesus' life. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Um, and the reason that I chose that second section over the first is that it seems that people within our tribe, like with more of my tribe, I guess, Christian evangelicals, I'm not assuming that I know all of you, um, but people in my tribe, they've spent hours and written thousands of pages on that first section, on what it means that Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in our current cultural climate, it seems like my tribe has no desire to talk about the second part. And when, it, when you start talking about, well, what do these truths mean as they flesh out in our lives, at least the people that I follow on social media and kind of the people that I grew up with, they don't want to talk about that part. And so that's where I wanted to focus. Um, and so if we get to the end of this, and you're like, man, I really want to learn more about, you know, what it, what it means theologically that Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just come talk to me. I can easily give you like 10,000 pages of books to read and people who've spent a lot of time on that. But that's just not going to be the main focus of what we're doing. You guys okay with that? doesn't matter because that's what's written right here. So, um, another really cool thing about this section that we're in tonight, uh, Mark 15, the crucifixion scene, 
is that it's one of the more familiar sections of the Bible. Um, I teach Old Testament at Eternity, and if we were here talking about Obadiah or Zephaniah or something like that or Leviticus, I'd have to spend a ton of time like really helping you understand how that story and that person and this place fits into the biblical narrative and what it's doing and what it, what it means and all that. Because honestly, there's probably parts of the Bible you just haven't spent a lot of time in, and that's totally fine. Um, but if you think about like our Christian tradition, at least here in the West, most people are seem to be pretty familiar with the crucifixion scene. We might thank Mel Gibson for that or the Bible for that. I don't really know who we're supposed to thank, but people know this part of the Bible. And so what's cool about it is that we get to kind of walk through it quickly because you know a lot of the details. And so just if you're, if you're like me and you're trying to track with the teacher and trying to kind of figure out like how long is he going to talk, just know that I'm going to kind of walk through it pretty quickly, but then we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about what it means for our Christian life. So when you realize we're at the end of the passage, you're like 60% done, okay? So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so what I want to do is I want to read our passage um, and then I want to pray. And I'd actually like somebody else to read because I don't like reading in front of people. So, Melissa, it would be great if you read for us as I stare at Austin. Go ahead. Mark uh, 15, 33 through 47, in your loud Melissa voice. Let's hear it. <laughs> and, when, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lema Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Is that yeah, you get, yeah, you get uh, 47. Okay. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. <clears throat> and there were also many other women who came up to him in Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Good. I'm going to pray. <clears throat> Jesus, I am very thankful for Mark. I'm thankful for your disciple who wrote this gospel. Um, and I'm thankful that he wants us to see things about you, uh, about your life, about your death, about this scene in the last days of your life. And I thank you that he has uniquely crafted this part of his story um, so that we could see you in a different light, so that we could see a different, beautiful facet of who you are. So Jesus, I pray that as we talk and as we study, as we discuss, um, I pray that we would see that. I pray that we would see that part of you that Mark wants us to see. And I pray that your spirit would enable us to see that. Um, and not just to see it, to understand it, but to see it in a way that causes us to live differently, to think differently, to feel differently. In your name we pray. Amen. 
All right. So like I said, uh, we're going to kind of focus on how Mark wants us to live our lives according to how he chooses to tell the story of Jesus' last days or last hours on earth. At the beginning of that section that Melissa read, thank you, Melissa. I hate reading in front of people. I know you probably do too, but I hate it more. So thank you for doing that. At the beginning of that section, um, there's that famous verse that says, Aloy, Aloy, Sama, or Lama Sabachthani. And then Mark says, that means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's interesting that that phrase, Aloy, Aloy, Lama Sabachthani, is an Aramaic phrase. And it seems really important. Think about this. It seems really important to Mark that his audience understand that Jesus said that phrase in Aramaic. Most of Mark's audience probably doesn't speak Aramaic. And that's pretty clear by the fact that he says a phrase in Aramaic and then he tells his audience, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Most of Mark's audience speaks or at least understands Greek, Koine Greek, and that's the language that he's writing in. But it seems important to Mark that when he records this, these last words of Jesus, that they're recorded in his gospel in the language that Jesus said them in, in Aramaic. Aramaic was likely the language that Jesus spoke at home. Um, you got to remember, like, Jesus was a child and he grew up in a first century Jewish house. Aramaic would have been the language that his mom, while holding him at night and singing songs to him, she would have sung to him in Aramaic. When she's helping him grow up as a young boy, she's speaking Aramaic to him. When Jesus is learning a trade with his dad, and he's learning to be a woodworker or a stonemason or whatever you believe that he was. I mean, the, all of that's happening when, when Joseph is like, Jesus, you do it like this. It's all happening in Aramaic. And when Jesus is in his last moments of his life, and when he is in pain, and when he screams out to his father, he's, he does it in Aramaic. He doesn't do it in Greek. He doesn't do it in Hebrew. He screams out in Aramaic. And I think that um, this was actually really hard for me to not follow this thread. Um, Jared did mention, but one of the things that's really important to me, that's a part of the churches that I've been a part of, is this idea of a multilingual gathering of people. And that somebody's heart language, meaning the language that their mother spoke to them, they ought to have full freedom of expression to cry to their God in that language in our gatherings. And I think that if I had chosen that first path, we would have spent the rest of the time really talking about what does it mean that Jesus is this first century Jewish man who grew up with his mom singing Aramaic to him. That on the cross, he does not scream out in Hebrew. He does not scream out in Greek. He screams out in this language that had formed him so much in his humanity on earth. But unfortunately, we're not going to get to go down that way. But it, it does teach us something about who Jesus is. It teaches us something that I think becomes important for the rest of the story. It teaches us something about the fact that Jesus was a fully human and fully God, a fully human in that moment person. And that he was so shaped by this language and this culture that that is his, when, when, when emotions have risen, when he's finally at the end of himself, that's what comes out. Now, the next little section um, in 35 and 36, there's this group of people that are watching the crucifixion happening. Uh, they're called like the bystanders, right? And the bystanders, we, Mark tells us that these bystanders, they hear Jesus cry out, Aloy, Aloy, Lema Sabachthani, and they say, oh my gosh, he's calling Elijah. And I think for us, um, well, yeah, if you're honest, it's kind of weird that Mark says, this means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then all these people are like, oh, he must be talking to Elijah. But culturally, it actually makes a ton of sense. See, culturally, many commentators will point out the fact that within Jesus' day, there exists um, this ideology, or this theology, if you will, that the end days, the eschaton, the, the moment when Yahweh, their God, was going to save them and deliver them from their oppressors, that those moments would be preceded by a prophet like Elijah. And that was a common belief amongst the Jews at that time. 
And they have this picture in their head of Elijah, who's most commonly known, or most, I don't know, he's best known for this scene where he battles the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 17. And we're not going to go read that whole story, but the short version of it is that Yahweh, the God of Israel, and Baal, the God of the Canaanites, they kind of have a showdown. And the end of that showdown is that fire falls from heaven and consumes, basically consumes the consumes the prophets of Baal. It doesn't actually consume them, but they lose the battle and then Elijah slaughters them and throws them in a river. It's a great story for your kids if you're <laughs> feeling like telling them a good Bible story. But you see that like there exists this thought or this, this ideology that when the Messiah comes and when he delivers his people from oppression, it will be preceded by an Elijah type figure coming down and doing some prophets of Baal type stuff to the people that are oppressing them. It will look like an Elijah coming and laying the smack down on the Romans who are have the nation of Israel under their thumb. That's what they're looking like. That's what they're looking for. And it seems pretty clear that these bystanders are actually Jewish people. Right? Like if they were just random Roman people sitting around, they wouldn't know who Elijah was. But they hear Jesus crying. And a lot of commentators would say that these people are, are ones that probably got wrapped up in the Jesus movement towards these last days of Jesus' life. That they probably came up to Jerusalem with him when he came from Galilee. And they're like, here he is. Here's the next Messiah. Here's the one who's going to deliver us. And they're kind of like this last cohort holding on, waiting for Jesus to finally be the Messiah they're all waiting for and to come down for Elijah to come, to take him off the cross and for them to just open a can of you know what, all over the Romans. That's what they want to happen in that moment. But it's funny because if you read the Gospel of Mark and you watch the life of Jesus, everything Jesus has been saying and doing is completely antithetical to that idea that that's how his kingdom is going to come in. Earlier in the Gospel, Jesus tells about his death, he foretells about his death three different times. And when he does, people are confused. Because he says things like, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus says. And they're like, well, no, the Son of Man comes to destroy our enemies. And it doesn't make sense to them. And so you have these bystanders that I think we could say, in a way, are representative of, of most of Israel at that time who, when they look at Jesus on the cross, they are still anticipating this violent and strong revolution to come and to deliver them from their oppressors. And it kind of seems like, here they are, Israelites, the, the covenant people of God, the ones called out all the way back from the Exodus, the ones who were meant to be God's prized possession, here they are, and they don't even get it. They don't get it. They un don't understand what Jesus is doing. But then, there's someone who does. And that someone is that Roman centurion. In verse 39, we finally meet someone who gets who this Jesus person actually is. 1539, it says that when the centurion, it's a Roman soldier, like a general or sergeant, when the centurion who stood facing him, saw the way that he had breathed his last breath. He said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And this is where the story, I think, for practical Christian living, it becomes very, very important. See, who is it that finally recognizes the true identity of Jesus? His disciples, I think, are ashamedly and blatantly absent from Mark's depiction of this scene right here. His disciples are not there right now. The bystanders, the Jewish people, these people who are the covenant people of God, they don't get it either. The person who actually understands who Jesus is, is a foreigner, is a Roman soldier. It's not a high priest. It's not a prophet of Yahweh. It's some dude who just works as a Roman soldier 
and to quote not so libre, he's on dead guy duty. He's just sitting there watching the crucifixion happening, happening, right? He's just, he's witnessing this whole thing happening. And of course, he's probably pretty important. He's a centurion. He's in charge of a bunch of people. But, but historians will tell you, he's definitely not like this career military officer. He's just like a normal dude who's kind of raised up through the ranks, who doesn't have a redemption history of his people being saved out of the Exodus about these promises of the Messiah coming. That's not him. He's just a random dude. And he says, that guy's the son of God. But I, what I witness right here, that guy's the son of God. And from this point, through the rest of this passage, we kind of move down this path that teaches us about Jesus' values and the type of kingdom that he's building. The Gospel of Mark is unique in the fact that Women aren't as present in it as they are in other Gospels. But if you read in 1540, look in, uh, look in your Bibles, Mark 1540, it says, So there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and the mother of, or Mary the mother of James, the younger, and Joseph and Salome. And when Jesus was in Galilee, these women had followed him and ministered to him. And they were also other women there who came up with him, to Jerusalem. You see, it's almost as if Mark has omitted the fact that these women were just all around Jesus, that there were these female disciples all around Jesus, in order to bestow on them kind of the greatest honor among the disciples. Because at the end of the life of Jesus, Peter's gone. Right? James and John, not there. It's, it's the women. It's Mary Magdalene. It's Mary, you know, a lot of people say this is the mother of Jesus, and it's probably not. It's just another Mary. It's just another woman and a whole bunch of other women who seem to be the only ones that have the courage enough to be there and to actually be present at the death of Jesus. The disciples, the male disciples, had fled, and they're hiding. The religious, of the, the religious elite of those days, they're the ones who construe this whole crucifixion thing to begin with. They don't get it either. The bystanders don't get it. They're waiting for this, this revolution, this violent military-based revolution to happen. And yet, when the dust clears, the ones who actually have the courage to faithfully follow Jesus till the end are these women. And Mary Magdalene, it's interesting that she's mentioned because the disciples had problems with her early on in Jesus' ministry. They had problems with the fact, probably in general, they had problems with the fact that there were female disciples. But more specifically, they had problems with the fact that Mary Magdalene, or Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene was there and also one of these female disciples. And yet she's mentioned as one of the ones who courageously served Jesus until the end. And I want to pause here for just a second and reflect on this point that I'm trying to make. See, because we could go one of two ways at this point in the story. I could sit here and get all teary-eyed and tell you to you know, be like the Roman centurion or be like these women who are faithful to Jesus. And you know what? You should probably be like the Roman centurion. You should probably be like these faithful women. But I actually think that most of us, just as middle to lower middle, upper middle class Western Christians, that we're a lot more like the Jews and the disciples than we are like the Roman soldiers. Like another sidetracked example of this would be like when you read the story or the parable of the prodigal son a lot of times we want to put ourselves in the place of the prodigal son the whole point of that story is to realize you're the older brother and I think that in this story the point is not like oh man I'm like the Roman centurion who really recognizes who Jesus is it's more like I'm like the Jews who don't get it I'm like the disciples who are hiding See, I think part of the point that Mark is trying to make by specifically mentioning this Roman centurion and the women disciples 
is how radical and crazy and almost shameful to the covenant people of God it is in a Roman soldier that a foreigner is the one to rightly identify Jesus. And then it's the women, the one who in Greco-Roman culture and in Jewish culture, these are the lesser of the two genders. It's the women who actually have the courage to stick around. And I think Mark is trying to make a point when he specifically mentions those people. I want to help us see in our culture who the cultural equivalents, if you will, of this Roman centurion and these female disciples would be. You know, kind of depending where you come from, those people could have this picture of kind of two ends of a spectrum. It could be that a cultural equivalent would be like this radical Trump supporter who has the MAGA hat on and his Instagram just filled with all these pictures of him and 15,000 guns and him defending his freedom and all that kind of stuff. Or, depending on where you come from, a cultural equivalent could be that Bernie bro who's at the rallies, he's wearing Birkenstocks, he cries when people drink coffee that's not organic. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> it could be one of those two. Now, let's be real. Those are like exaggerations, like little funny things that I just made up. But I think what Mark wants us to see is that there is likely someone, a type of person, that you think is the least likely to see Jesus for who he really is. Mm -hmm. There is a type of person that exists that you think, purposefully or unpurposefully, that's not a word, but whatever, purposefully or not, you think they probably don't have what it takes to follow Jesus. But Mark wants us to see that. He wants to recognize, he wants us to recognize that we have those biases about people. Or think about a cultural equivalent of like a Mary Magdalene. This could be the woman that you pass on the way to work who is experiencing homelessness, she's not really all there. And you think, well, if she joins the movement, I don't think she's going to make it to the end. Or if it could be this woman that you know from your work who she's got four or five kids, she's a single mom, you find out she's pregnant again, and you're like, man, that, that woman, I mean, God bless her, but I just, I don't know if she was really a part of our movement, this whole Jesus thing, if she would make it. And like the disciples, and like the disciples would have viewed women in the first century, and specifically Mary Magdalene, we find ourselves thinking those horrible thoughts about these women. We find ourselves thinking these really unhealthy and shameful thoughts about a certain type of person that we just think like, yeah, they're not going to really understand who Jesus is. But Mark wants us to see through these examples that he gives, that these are actually the types of people that Jesus attracts to himself. And these are the types of people who remain faithful to him until the very end. In their culture, and I would argue in our culture, these are the types of people that our society would least expect. And yet they're the ones that Jesus attracts to himself. So the story keeps going with um, a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. And I think that this story is one of the first examples of radical Christian living that we get in the Bible. You see, up until this point, and, and this is just because of the timeline, but Joseph of Arimathea becomes the first person to not just obey a command, but to see the life and the death of Jesus and to say, I know what that means. For my life, I know what that means right now. And not because in Deuteronomy 15.32 it says that I have to do all these things. No. It is the Spirit of God working in him to realize this is what it means when I see that this Jesus has now died. I know what it means for my life. And there's two things about Joseph of Arimathea that I want to mention. One of them is that this dude was very clearly loaded. He's rich. 
Um, the, most historians would say that the grave that Jesus is buried in, it must have been Joseph's grave. And saying that you have a, uh, an unoccupied, freshly hewn out of the rock grave is kind of like the first century equivalent of saying, this dude is loaded. Like, he's got stacks. Don't worry about him. He's doing fine. But the second thing is that he's a member of the council or of the, the ruling council or sometimes it's called the Sanhedrin. See, Joseph held this position of honor and status and power within his culture. And we see that when, when he sees Jesus die on the cross, that his first reaction to that is to use the honor and status and power and privilege that he has in order to fully follow and love Jesus. And we know this is what's happening because Joseph goes and talks to Pilate, who's kind of a big deal. And you're, you do not just get a random audience with Pilate unless you're also kind of a big deal, unless you're a billionaire who has really high honor and status in the community, then you get to walk in and talk to Pilate. And even more specifically, Crucifixions, when they happened in the first century, the idea was that bodies would stay up there on the cross and they'd rot for months. And they would happen outside the gates of the city. And the whole purpose was that when you walked into the city, you would see this body rotting on the cross. And you would know this is what happens to people who try and rebel against Rome. And then you walk into a Roman-occupied city. So the fact that Joseph makes, it says that he takes courage and he makes an outlandish request to Pilate that he could get the body of Jesus from the cross. This dude is putting literally everything he has on the line. He's putting his wealth, his status, his honor, his power, his privilege, all of it is put on the line for Jesus in those short few verses. Now, that's the story. And like I said, you're not done. You're like, oh, that's it, we're done. Cool. I told you that wasn't going to happen. So what I want to do is I first want to pause, and I just want to ask, just very generally, what is it that is going on in your head right now? It doesn't have to be profound thought. It can be. It doesn't even have to be a question. It could just be, this is what I'm thinking. Anybody? Yes, Christmas shirt. <laughs> I was just thinking that um, Jesus constantly said that you have to be childlike, like the mm. low, you have to be the lowest to follow him and to understand. And I kept thinking, like, he kept showing these things to the disciples over and over and over again, let the children come to me, like, you have mm. to be childlike. Mm -hmm. And then the people who are most childlike in society, who knew nothing and were completely humble and didn't pretend to know anything, was the Gentile, the centurion, mm. and the women. Mm -hmm. And that's why they got it, mm -hmm. I think. And yeah. that's like what it's always been about with mm -hmm. Jesus. And I think it just started on that that day. Yeah, like that. that's good. Chuck, Jessica, Sarah, Bill, and Anybody else? Skittles? Yes, um, Skittles. Yeah, I just, I just think that's my nickname. <laughs> that's my yeah. 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 call right now. What's that? That's a thing. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, just thinking like even the rich, um, even the fact that he was rich is like you know Jesus specifically said that mm -hmm. it's harder, it's almost impossible for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right. And then he gave the analogy about the camel, mm -hmm. because I had a needle, and I just am thinking like man, being like I I think about I I totally I love the way you pointed out where the disciples are right in this moment in the story mm -hmm. and then I think ahead to where they are mm -hmm. and or are going right. and I wonder like man how how do they get there mm -hmm. um, and then just thinking through like the way Jesus like continually reveals himself mm -hmm. um, and graciously reveals himself to them and, mm -hmm. and fills them with the spirit mm -hmm. and I guess I, I guess I, my thought is always to be like man okay yeah I get, I get that I'm totally like the disciples in the way that they're acting in this story but I so don't want to be yeah so like, that's good how can I like submit mm -hmm. 
or how can I be um, like the Roman centurion right. um, with, even though I'm not? That's a great question, Austin. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good question. I forgot the name was Skittles. Back I know. <laughs> <My word. laughs> okay. um, yeah, that is really good. And um, I didn't plant this, but that's exactly what I want to talk about. So, good job. Jesus. Oh, it's the Skittles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He might go to hell for saying it was the Skittles and not Jesus, but that's really funny. Okay, so I want us to think about what it means to examine, not what it means, I want us to examine our biases. You know, I kind of like really quickly moved past that point that there is probably somebody, a type of person that you think they, they can't get it. And I don't really know who it was, but I want us to think about that for a second. But one of the phrases that I skipped over in the Mark account was Mark said, um, kind of this parenthetical statement that when Jesus died, the curtain tore in two, and, and then it kind of just moved on to the story, and I skipped it. And there's a lot of people who write a lot of books and a lot of pages to tell you know, exactly what does that mean. But one of the things that I think it points to, you know, one of the meanings of it, is that that curtain in the temple, it was a symbol of the fact that mankind and God are separate. Right? It was a symbol that represented that there was only one man, one time a year, from a certain ethnicity, from a certain tribe, and even from a certain paternal line who could go into the presence of God and cross that curtain. But in that moment, when Jesus dies, that curtain is gone. And every stereotype that existed before about who can and cannot commune with the Creator God there's something about the death of Jesus that tears that curtain. There's something about these... these. Uh, we're not going to go all the way down there, but Paul talks about this later in the book of Romans, that there's something about a uh, human nature that wants to classify people, wants to say that some people got it and some people don't. And yet, the death of Jesus tore that curtain. And now there is not a type of person who cannot enter in and commune with the Creator God through Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want for all of us to examine our own biases. And I, I'm, I mean like very serious about this. We're going to like pause and think for a couple of minutes. And for you, I don't know who it is. I don't know what type of person it is. I mean, maybe it is that militaristic, nationalistic Trump supporter. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's a radical feminist that you think, I don't think they could really see who Jesus actually is. Or maybe it's people who experience homelessness in Los Angeles. Or maybe it's people from the LGBTQ community. Or maybe it's an unauthorized immigrant. Or maybe... It's a middle-class white person living in the suburbs. I don't know what it is for you, but I, I want you to seriously consider, because I think Mark is trying to teach us that we have these categories. We have this Roman centurion and female disciple and Mary Magdalene categories of the people that we don't think could actually get it. So, it might be awkward, but take a couple minutes. Close your eyes if you want. And really think about it. Who is it that you think is least likely to truly see who Jesus is? I'll give you a couple of minutes.
I don't know if that's a couple minutes, but it seemed close to it. Now, I'm not gonna make you like share with the whole group right now, especially you don't even know me. And you're like, people who wear bandanas and have dreadlocks, that's what I don't like. So, but I do, I do seriously and honestly encourage you, I think Mark wants you to share that with somebody in the church. Um, somebody who might not know it about you uh, because until you can learn to see those people, whatever, whoever they are, and not as the ones who probably won't get it, then you're going to be stuck like the disciples, like the Jewish people, and like the religious elite of Jesus' day. Now, this is funny, and by funny, I mean that's me deflecting emotion, because it's not funny. Um, I wrote down here who I feel it is. And I wrote down here, because um, I kind of transcript my notes a little bit, I said that I have a really hard time with militaristic Trump supporters, and that's true, I do. Um, and I have friends from back home that, yeah, they're defending their country and their family against deer, basically. But they have all these guns, and, um, you know, and they hate my neighbors, and they think that, um, yeah, anyways. But as I'm thinking, the truth is that I have multiple types of people. I don't know, I guess I'm a jerk. But I have multiple types of people. And for me, what's funny, which is motion deflection, is that it's rich people. It's really hard for me to look at a rich person, a middle-class white rich male, and say, I think that you could get and understand the good news of Jesus. It's really, really hard for me. And what's really stupid about that, again, stupid is an adjective to deflect my emotions, is that Joseph of Arimathea is that person. He's a rich dude. Like the story even includes a rich guy who gets it. But yet still in my mind, the guy sitting on this really comfortable stool <laughs> is, <laughs> I, I still don't get it. I still don't get it, if I'm being honest. Um, and maybe some of you are like me, I'm just gonna assume some of you are, that your best friends aren't wearing MAGA hats and your best friends aren't uber wealthy businessmen downtown. Maybe that's you. And here's the danger, this is not my notes, but here it is anyways. Here's the danger about living in Los Angeles and living in a, a more left-leaning culture. You can seem like a pretty good Christian living here when the people that you gravitate towards are the socially outcast. And people look at you and they'll be like, man, like that is, you know, Ernesto, he really loves Jesus because he loves homeless people. Or Ernesto really loves Jesus because him and Renee want, or they're fostering and adopting. Or Ernesto really loves Jesus because him and Renee have their kids in LUSD, even though they know it's a bad school and they have lockdown drills and things like that. Like, Ernesto and Renee really love Jesus. But all the while, I'm sitting here thinking, the rich dude from Thousand Oaks, he's not going to get it. And at the longer that I continue to think that, I will just remain in a state of not getting it, like the disciples. Mm -hmm. I will not really truly understand who Jesus is, mm -hmm. and the significance of his death, and what he came to do. I just won't get it. So as we close, I want to think about that rich man that I probably wouldn't have liked, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, as I said at the beginning of our time, um, this section is probably one of the more familiar passages of the stories in the Bible. Like, if you go outside and you just ask people about the gospel, they're probably going to be able to tell you Jesus was born because of Christmas and that he died. And they probably, maybe they don't believe it or whatever, but like, it's part of the story that everyone kind of seems to know. And the danger of those types of stories is that they become so familiar that they don't affect us at all anymore. For the last few months here at NoHo Church, you have studied the life of Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. You've heard Jesus make claims about the kingdom. 
You've seen him heal people. You've seen him perform miracles. You've seen his disciples struggle to understand what it is that he's the Messiah, what it is that, what it actually means that he's the Son of Man. And if you're following the development of Mark from the beginning to this point, this part of the story is supposed to kind of take you aback. And it's supposed to kind of blow you away a little bit. I mean, it's almost like this is an impossible thought experiment, but if you were able to get rid of all your information about Jesus and just read this story, and you see that there's one man making these claims, and then there's a whole group of people making another claim about him, and then he just goes to the cross and dies, <coughs> it's supposed to affect you. And when this becomes a familiar story, it stops affecting us that Jesus died on a cross to be a servant and a ransom for many. Interestingly, and I think you'll talk about this next week, in the Gospel of Mark, in the original manuscripts, this is the only positive reaction that we have to Jesus' death. It's this guy, Joseph of Arimathea. And like I said earlier, I think that Joseph is presented as the first example of radical Christian living when you reflect upon the death of Jesus. Earlier in Mark, when the disciples and the crowds were struggling to understand the type of Messiah that Jesus was going to be, in Mark 10, 45, he says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to become a servant, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Joseph is the first of Jesus' followers to finally just get it. And when he sees the way of Jesus, when he sees that Jesus used all that was available to him, every asset, every resource, every power available to him, not to demand service and not to demand respect from others, but instead to serve others and to give his life down for him, the only possible reaction that Joseph of Arimathea has is to respond by giving everything he has, his honor, his wealth, his status, everything to truly love and follow after this Jesus. Church history tells us that Joseph of Arimathea was not welcomed back in the Sanhedrin. You probably can guess why. Which might just seem like he didn't go back, get to go back to his job, but no, he lost his honor, he lost his status, he lost his clout, he lost his power, he lost everything. And other histories that aren't as clear tell us that what he did at that point was he went north and he started to tell people about Jesus. And some people say he made it all the way to modern day England. And it's just one of those early missionary stories that we don't ever really hear about because the book of Acts follows Paul and Peter and those apostles. But when Joseph of Arimathea sees Jesus die on the cross, there's not a hesitation about him for what that means for his life. Mark tells us that Joseph had been seeking after the kingdom. We don't know exactly what that means. I mean, maybe he was some of the people in the crowds with Jesus around Jerusalem. Or maybe he was watching from his place of status, but like paying a lot of really close attention. Or maybe he had a long conversation with Nicodemus, another dude who was in his same status that had had an encounter with Jesus. But maybe you, and I only really know Melissa and Mary Beth and Jared through pictures on Mary Beth's desk. But maybe you guys have been seeking after the kingdom of God for a while. And whatever means, that means for you. In whatever way that means for you. Again, I don't know you personally enough to, to say, well, this is what that means for you and that's what it means for you. But I think the question that Mark poses to all of us, myself included, is do we respond to the servant death of Jesus in the radical Christian living that Joseph of Arimathea responds with? Do we respond in a way in which we use every aspect of our lives for the sake of his kingdom that we say that we're seeking after? I'm not talking about 10% of our income that we give to the church. I'm talking about your checking account, your savings account, your 401k, your IRA, your car, your house. Do all of these things have an end in them that further advances the kingdom? 
Because what Joseph of Arimathea does, a proper response to the servant death of Jesus, is to say, well, Jesus gave it all, so that's the movement that I'm a part of. And your power, your privilege, your status, your positions, your honor, your clout in this culture, in this community, in your job place, in your job, in your work, in your families. Are they being used and are you willing to sacrifice them for the sake of the kingdom? Because I think that Mark believes that's what radical Christian living in response to Jesus looks like. I think that Mark teaches us that the death of Jesus ought to compel us towards a radical Christian life that actively examines our biases towards other people, actively pushes us to say, do I truly believe that Jesus came for everybody? That Jesus chooses the unlikely within our society? And I believe that Mark teaches us that the death of Jesus ought to compel us towards a radical Christian life where we respond to Jesus by literally giving everything that we have in order to seek after the kingdom. And let me be super clear before you just write off what I said. I'm not saying empty your checking account, your savings account, sell your car, sell your house, and give it to Jared or something like that. That's not what I'm saying. If you would know what to do with that kind of money, you know? Um, but what I am saying is, okay, you have an IRA. You have a 401k. You have a 529 savings plan for your kid. Or whatever it is you've got. You've got a car. You've got a house. Are those assets, that power, that resource, that privilege that you have here in this culture, are they being used in a means to advance the kingdom? Because if they're not, then I just think, not that like you're in big trouble or something like that, but that we, we just don't fully understand the goodness of what Jesus came to bring through his death on the cross. All of our lives, both in how we perceive and interact with others and how we use that which has been given to us, it ought to mirror the mission of the Messiah, of the Son of God, who has come not to be served, but to be a servant and to give his life as a ransom for many. You with me? All right. I'm going to pray. And then I don't know what happens. That's it. That's it. <laughs> okay. Then you sing the song, actually. Okay. I thought that was everybody else here who sang. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, I am super thankful. Truly, I am super thankful for your life. And um, the amount of power and privilege that I have, it actually, it's a lot here in Los Angeles, in America, compared to other places and people in the world and even here in our culture. But it is nothing compared to what you had. It is nothing compared to what you laid down for the sake of the kingdom. And Father, I thank you for that rich man that I would have judged, that I would not have wanted to associate with, that I would have said, he's not going to get it. And yet your spirit moved in his heart and he is the example that I'm supposed to follow. Father, I pray, um, I pray that those of us here who have been seeking the kingdom for a while, I mean, we love you, we have loved you for a long time, that you would cause us to examine if we're doing that in a Christ-like way. If we are giving up everything we have because we truly believe that the kingdom is worth it. And God, I am thankful for the beginning of the next chapter that shows us how worth it it is. That shows us how beautiful your gospel truly is. And the new life that you want to bring to all of creation. So I pray that you would give us the courage to be like those women that society looked down upon and to just stick by you until the end. I pray that you would give us discernment to 
to see who you truly are. And I thank you again that you came, that you lived a life, and that you gave your life as a ransom for all of us. Amen. Amen. Amen.